So listen, I'm a long-winded preacher, and you'll be seeing a lot after this anyway. <laughs> All right. Did you already cut that on? Oh no, I'm being captured. Gotcha. All right. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that that we can come uh, to you. We can come before your throne, and uh, we can express our hearts and our burdens and. Uh, you hear us, and we also can express uh, prayers to intercede on others' behalf. And Father, we think of those, especially of Polly, uh, this, uh, as we start our service and, and her need of a Savior. Uh, we ask that you would help her physically, that she might um, be able to come home, and, and that there would be a relationship started between her and Barbara, and there'd be an opportunity produced through that relationship to share the gospel with her. We ask now, Lord, that you'd work as only you can work. We ask for your blessings tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 240, a haven of rest.
we're going to have a, a hopefully a brief business meeting on July 3rd. There are actually I'm enlisting to the business meeting. I found out I have made a couple mistakes that we need to correct. Um, anyway, at least one big one, uh, but there are two mistakes that I caught. And also June 29th, which will be uh, next uh, Wednesday, uh, we will have the cookout here. Um, I would say come dressed in casual clothes. I may shock you in what I show up in, <clears throat> but it will not be suit and tie. I can remember the first time I ever seen my pastor without a suit and tie on. He looked at me like I was crazy. He said, you know, I don't wear one of those all the time. I said, I really didn't know, you know. But anyway, so uh, please uh, prepare to, to come and enjoy yourself, and it will be good, clean fellowship, guaranteed. All right, turning your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, we're going to uh, <clears throat> start in verse 13. Um, we finished off the end of verse 12 with uh, presenting a question. said that every believer uh, should ask themselves, have I examined my life to ensure I'm walking with God? We need to do that we periodically to be sure that we are uh, checking over our spiritual life, our spiritual growth, being sure that we are living our life for Christ. Time with God, devotions, time in the Word. Um, uh, decisions, the decisions I make, do they cater to the flesh or do they honor God? Um, and I mentioned, I believe sometimes we tend to water down our faith in order to do the things that are pleasing to us. And I think we need to be very careful of that, that we don't uh, allow that to become a pattern in our life. We need to walk with God and not in the flesh. Okay, so... In 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going into verse 13 now. And it says, Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? <clears throat> we have really a, what I would consider a, a thought-invoking statement. And there's a lot here. I don't, uh, I don't know it's ever possible to exhaust the Word of God as you think through and meditate in it. Um, as you walk with God, He begins to unfold things and truths to you. But he starts off this, he says, who is he that will harm you? Uh, what fears do uh, they who tend to do good with their life have? Um, uh, we could also probably rephrase and say, uh, who do you fear if you're right with God? If you're really living for God, if you're really living your life for God, if you're a spiritual person growing and maturing in Christ, who do you really fear? Where is, the, where is your fear placed? Um, I think reading this, the, the writer is alluding to those that do evil. Uh, they live in fear. They live uh, worried about the consequences of their action. They have a guilty conscience. They have a guilty spirit, if you would. Um, I don't believe the, the Christian, those that live uh, righteous before God, should have that. If you have that, I would assume there's something terribly wrong in the way you're living and what you're claiming to be is for God. I, I don't think that, that guilt should be there. Uh, I remember before I was saved, I was pretty much a weekend alcoholic. I was involved in drugs and all this. And I can remember as um, I would go around, there was a point in time where I actually carried a 25 auto in my pocket all the time because I lived in fear of what might happen. The people I dealt with, the police chopping and arresting me, and there was always fear. Always. Of what? Somebody might catch me doing what I was involved with. It was, it was constant. And, and trust me, somebody said, well, you was a bad guy. I said, no, I wasn't. The rest of them that I run with were. Those were the bad guys. Um, I, yeah, I don't think they knew any fear. But I, I did drink, drink and I did things that, that were not Christian-like at that point. Um, and I watched out all the time. A Christian should not live like that. Matter of fact, I'll just say this. Since I've been saved and living for the Lord, I have not lived like that. Um, I would think there was something wrong with my life if I went back to that. Uh, I would have no peace. Now I have peace of God. I know that I'm right with God. I know I'm in God's will and doing what He would have me to do. And so I don't have to watch out for these things. I don't have to fear what's coming. Some might say, well, you know, you could die tomorrow. Hallelujah, I could. And I might not like the manner in which I die. But I know I'm going to like what comes after death. Okay? I don't have to fear that. 
Um, and matter of fact, you don't have to fear your death. Is, am I telling you that you might enjoy it? No, I'm not telling you that. And don't go around saying I said that. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, if you're putting your faith and you're trusting God, there's no sense to fear what's coming because you understand He's in control. It doesn't mean we're going to enjoy everything, but it does mean we can place our faith and trust in Him and we don't have to fear what's coming. Uh, we don't have to fear what's out there. And by the way, if you watch news enough, that's what's being thrown out to us, the fear, the shootings, the stabbings, the erratic behavior of people. If you watch any, um, and I, I do catch, I've gotten so I don't watch it every day, but I do try to go back and, and catch up on some. And um, I'll tell you, as I've said many times, this is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm like Abraham. I'm, I'm, I'm sojourning in a foreign land. And one day, I'm going to go to the place that God has promised. But until then, I have to contend with what's here. But if God is the one who's providing for me, if God is the one who's looking out for me, can he not do a better job than I'm doing for myself? Then anything that happens is by the hand of God. And I have to trust that. Um, uh, let, me, um, let me say something and then I'm going to go into... Uh, let me say a couple something somethings. Okay, let me just put it that way. Okay. I think uh, uh, looking and thinking about this, uh, he says... Um, in, in 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, the ears are open unto the prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And, and we, then we get down here, and, and who is he that will harm you? You say, well, the evil person could be looking to harm you. I don't think he can trust you unless God allows him to. I mean, he can hurt you unless God allows him to. Um, and I will, I will touch that a little bit more, but I don't think if you have the peace of God... You have to, to worry about watching out. You don't have to worry about something uh, that's going to happen in your life. I don't think there's anything that can happen in your life that, that you should fear, that actually carries a threat for you. Why do I say that? Exactly. That's the first. That's, the, that's a very good point. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Bruce? And see, that's, you're both hit the point exactly. Um, there's always going to be something to fear. You know, I've talked to people before and they say, you know, I don't know what to do when I get old. Really? Don't worry, you'll be there before you know it. Just yesterday I was 16. And somehow or another, I looked at my birthday a couple, uh, last year, and they turned that number around. It was no longer 16, but 61. How'd that happen? It'll catch you before you know it. Uh, you, can, you can find things to fear, but you need to learn how to trust God. There is so much that happens in life that is unpredicted. It's like there was um, Rumsford, uh, what was his name that was, when he was doing the, the Iraqi war that he was so involved. You have your known knowns, you have your unknown knowns, and then you have your unknown unknowns. And I'm thinking... You, 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 know, you remember what I'm talking about? They were talking about how you prepare for war. And he, he went through all this. Well, the truth is, you don't know what tomorrow holds you. You will never know. But you can know who holds that and who knows what's going on. And that's God. And you trust in Him. Trust in Him to orchestrate your life. Um, I, I, I look at the, the lost and, and, and the lost love. The, it used to, uh, maybe two or three years ago, the, the big saying was, it was probably longer than that because we had COVID and all. It's probably four or five years ago. The big saying was, no fear. No fear. It on all the shirts, on just about everything. No fear, no fear. And here we are, claiming to be Christian. We're afraid of everything. Here they are lost. They got nothing that they should not be afraid of. And, and they're claiming no fear. There's something backwards here. We're the ones that should not fear. We're, we're, they're the ones that should. Because when they leave this world, they got no promises except for the wrath of God. But we have all the promises of God. Um, <clears throat> I am, uh, or let me rephrase it. I, I really, I get amused sometimes 
uh, visiting people and, and I'm talking with them and, and especially when everything's going their way and um and I, I find out pretty quick um whether they're saved, where they are spiritually, and 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 I, and I get real amused when and if we get into fears and they start telling me what they're afraid of. I'm like, you just sat and told me how big a Christian you were. You just told me about all the things and how God is blessing you, and now you've listed out more fears than you have blessings. And and it's kind of amusing to me because is that not backwards? Do you understand what I'm saying or am I muddying the waters? I don't see where the, you can have both. I don't see where God can be heaping all these blessings on you and you can be maturing in Christ and yet to be so scared, so scared, so scared, something costly. You know, I can't even go out my house anymore. Uh, we have a lot of people nowadays that have anxiety problems. I think number one anxiety problem is they don't know God well enough. I think the closer you walk with God, the further those things get away from you. I really do. Um, you start talking about the things that worry you. Let me ask you this. When you begin to mention the things that worry you, what's on your mind? What's consuming your mind? Well, somebody's already gotten there, haven't they? Whatever you're worrying about, that's where your whole life is centered on. Where's God? Where, where's the blessings of God? What is all God doing? What is, about Him sending Christ to the cross and all the blessings you receive? Where's all that if you're so consumed in your worries? Your focus has, has, has gotten off what it should be. You're, you're focused more in the flesh. Um, you know, that's probably actually the next verse I'm teaching you now, but anyway. <clears throat> It says here, he says, who is he that will harm you? I, I, he's not telling you you'll never be harmed. He's telling you, I think, he's, he's alluding to the fact that if we live righteous, we don't have a whole lot of worries. He says, if you be followers of good, if you're following after that which is right, um, is God able to secure you in any uh, situation? In other words, can he preserve you through? Can he keep you safe no matter what's happening? Does that allow room for doubt? Let's get real for a minute now. Let, let's really get down where rubber meets the road. Um, you're maturing in Christ. You're, 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 everything is, is, is you're, you're, you're just getting closer and closer. And then in, you have some great uncertainty come along. Could you doubt? I think I could. But I would hope it'd be momentarily, <laughs> you know. But can we not? What am I going to do? It's human. It's emotion. You, you, you're in a corruptible flesh. There is, I'm not trying to paint a superhuman Christian. That's what I'm trying to get back to. Even though we are maturing, even though we're falling in Christ, can we not occasionally doubt, struggle, have problems with our walk? Sure, sure. But we have to come back. We have to dig, um, learn to grab a hold of those fears, those anxieties, those problems. Instead of feeding on them, Put them back. What did, what did Paul say? He said, I beat my flesh down. Is that not part of it? Suppressing those things and turning back to the cross and turning back. I think as humans, we'll always struggle, you know. Um, and I think sometimes when we don't struggle, other people struggling can cause struggles in us. <laughs> they, they ignite things. Do you understand that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it's obvious. Uh, these things happen. Um, let me um, who is he that will harm you uh, who is he that can harm you change that word will it can has the ability to harm you if God says no who has that ability? Who is stronger than God? Who can override his authority? So, um, again, we go back to, I've mentioned this several times. Do you really believe that God is all-powerful? I'm going to say it in a little bit different form. Do you really believe God is all-powerful? Do you really believe God controls everything? 
Can you really trust him? Can you trust that he's all powerful? Can you trust that he control? Can you trust that he is a benevolent God and everything he does is for your good? Okay. Now we'll go back to the other three I mentioned before. God doesn't care about your health. God doesn't care about your wealth. He can raise the dead to life. Okay. He can give you any amount of money. He can take it all. He can give it to you. He created all the world. So all those things. He doesn't care about because he, he deals with that. So all these other three things that are happening in your life is to bring about the one thing he cannot take. He cannot. What is it? And I've said this so I don't know how many times. I get a grin or two. Somebody would say it. What is it that he wants? Relationship. Relationship. Relation. God has given you a free will. He'll take your health to get that. He'll take your wealth to get that. God wants a relationship. He can't take that. He's given you the ability to choose. All these things work together to bring you to a place. He puts that protection. I, I, I honestly believe this. When I read this verse, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? I honestly believe that as I walk with God and I'm doing what God wants me to do, that God puts a fence around me. I believe at times that fence is impregnable. Nobody can come in. Uh, let me say it in this way. I believe I'm immortal till God's done with me. And then you can get like Paul. I've run the race. I've finished my course. It's over. Okay. But I believe I'm immortal. I believe God's got a fence around me. Nothing comes through except for God opens it. And I think the further I get away from God, the more he cracks the gate. <laughs> he gets my attention. He helps me to understand that I need to be under the shadow of his wings. I need to be there next to him. And I think he orchestrates life so it's like that. For we, there's, I believe there's always a blessing uh, from God for those that live in righteousness. Am I telling you there are never struggles? No, because I'd be lying to you if I told you that. Um, how many of you remember seeing me hop along here like hop along Cassidy? My right side of my body does not like me. I don't know whatever reason it is. My left foot will give me a problem. My, I mean, my right foot, my right hip, and right now it's my right shoulder. Well, it's kind of, if you've been praying for it, it is actually is better. It's taken a while to get better. It has its bad days. Um, but it seems like that side it maybe belongs to Satan. I don't know. But it's, I'm, I, I, it's always something with it. But you know what? We need that. Because I say, Lord, if you would just take this pain away sometime, you know. I was telling Beard the other night, I, I was sleeping and I did something. And boy, it woke me up. So for some reason, I don't know why I was this fool, I'm laying on my, my left side and I took my, my arm and I raised it up like this. Well, that's fine. It actually felt good. Then I fell asleep. It dropped backwards. Woo! Out the bed like Superman. I mean, I was getting out of there. It's just intense pain when it did that. I was like, why in the world would I do that? I did, anyway, it got my attention. Um, so... If you be followers, that is good. Now, I, I want to I wanna take a little run here for a little bit. And, and, and this, is, this is a bigger rabbit. Um, the word here used for followers, when I looked it up, is, is the word that has the idea of an imitator. If ye be imitators of that which is good. The idea is, uh, or the question I want to put to you is, do we imitate what we see in Christ? Do we imitate what we're taught by Scripture? Um, what we're taught about Christ-like, by what God wants us to be, the commands. Are we trying to imitate these things and bring them to fruition in our life? He says, uh, who is he that will harm you if you be followers, if you be imitators of that which is good? Uh, if it's not talking about Christ, are there moral people that do good? And we think good of them because they do good. They're moral. So even those would not have the guilty conscience. But I like to put it back into that, that spiritual connotation now. Uh, Acts 11.26. Anybody know the significance of that verse? Acts 11.26. And they were first called Christians at Antioch. And I wanted to go to that for a minute. Um, Acts 11.26. And the Bible says, he says, uh, starting at um, 
verse 25, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Why were they called Christians? Because they were followers of Christ. That was the whole idea. That was the meaning. They were followers. Um, and we, at times, it, it also Christ, uh, the, the idea or the, the definition of Christ, uh, that word also means or would mean anointed one, if you would. And so, <clears throat> let me make a leap here and, and, and get into this. Um, what does it mean to be anointed? What is the idea of anointed? Anything from the Bible you know about anointing? Tell me what you know. Say again. Setting somebody apart. When did you, when have you read about it first in the in the Bible? Old Testament kings. Thank you. That's where exactly where I was wanting you to go. Um, Saul stands, I mean, not Saul, Samuel stands before uh, Jesse and his sons, and, and David's not there, and they pass before uh, Samuel. He says, This one, no, this one, no, this one, no. None of these God has chosen. And so he says, Have you got any more? And they called David out of, uh, away from the sheep, out of the pastures, out of the fields, and he come, and um, uh, I think Samuel was a little surprised. Him? And he said, Don't look at the outward, I'm looking on the heart. And he uh, anointed him to be king over Israel. That anointing was what? What was that action doing? It was a choosing. He'd been chosen. God chose him, right, to be the next king. Now, we come back into the New Testament and we have these Christians, these followers of Christ. And the idea of Christ being the anointed one. What was, why was Christ the anointed one? Because he was the Messiah. He was the one that was, had, had been chosen to come, if you would. And so now we have uh, Christians. Uh, are Christians anointed? Now I'm getting everybody all tense. Are believers anointed? I'll make it easier for you. Are you chosen in Christ? And no, I'm not a Calvinist. Okay? But there is a very, very good thing here that we need to understand. So let's speak a little bit about election, because that's what this is. Um, we're talking about uh, what, what is election and, and what does it mean to be elect before the foundations of the world? Is that not what the Bible says? Elect before the foundations of the world? What does that mean? Um, uh, as we said about anointing, the word, the root of the word um, is elect, and, and the idea means to be carefully selected. And those who are elected are are carefully selected group. They are a chosen group who meet certain criteria. Does anybody disagree with that? And that's fine if you do. Uh, I don't mind because I'm going to um, give you an example here that's going to help. All right, here's the example. Let's say you go shopping today, and you go into the store. Let's say you go into the superstore. And I like apples, so I'm going to go buy some apples. You ever been and seen the apples they got stacked up there? The Gallows, the Granny Smiths, the Crim whatever they are. And, and all those apples look about the right size. They, they, unless you get the orchard run, they're all shiny, pretty. They're all about the same size. They look perfect. There's no imperfection. Of course, you could buy a bag of the imperfect ones, you know. But you understand what I'm saying. Why are they all the same? <laughs> That's exactly right. They have a little slots and stuff they go through. They choose them out. They, they take the bad ones out. And those are what we would call, you ever heard the term selects? You would if you get oysters, because what? They choose them out. They select the different sizes and put them in. So it's not really a bad connotation. So what we're looking at is these apples that look so nice and perfect. They're without blemishing and bruising. They would... Um, they would, at a glance, with their color, their firmness, their size, be free from any obvious defects. Defects. Um, they meet a certain criteria. Uh, uh, this is the best idea of election I can get you. If you're one of the elect, it's because you've met a criteria. 
is because before the foundation of the world, God says, if you will trust in Jesus Christ as personal Savior, I'll save you and you'll be elect. It's not a Muslim God that takes and throws some into hell randomly and some into heaven. It doesn't work like that. God has laid down before the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ was going to die on Calvary's cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins. And if we trust in him, then our election is sure. We are elect in him. And I think so often, um, by the way, that's where predestination cuts in. When somebody says, well, we're either predestined to hell or predestined to heaven, that's untrue. You're predestined in Christ to eternal life. Okay? Yes, sir. Well, I think of that scripture, or whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to become the sons of God. He, he knew who would accept Christ. Yeah. It's, and and, and I've, had, I've had people argue with me, say, what you're arguing for is that um, um, he knew, so he saved you. Well, yeah, he knew. But I had the choice. Remember that fellow, I keep bringing this up over and over again because it made such an impression on me. You can make any choice you want, but you can't choose the consequences. Christ said, this is the criteria. You choose this, you become elect. You become part of my family. You don't choose this, <laughs> this is the consequence John 3.36, but the wrath of God abideth on them. You, that's it. Uh, you know, and, and I think, I, I say this and I use this, um, this uh, illustration here because I think it's, it simplifies something that some people make so hard and so confusing. Now, election's not a confusing thing. God sets out the criteria and we either choose or don't choose to accept it. How, how, do, you, how do you choose a president or your prime minister. You elect him. How do you elect him? You, you cast your vote for him. You know. I th like I said. It's, it's, it's a very. Um, a simplistic. Uh, uh, description. Or, or definition. If you would. Um, we submit to his word. That was decreed before the foundations of the world was created. This is this person who will trust in this, who will accept the blood uh, atonement of Jesus Christ, shall be my child. And he shall be elect. He shall be with me. He's chosen out. Um, any questions? I think I'm going to try cracking this next verse. He goes into this next verse. 14, he says, And who is he that will harm you? Excuse me, I'm reading 13. But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. Um, let's stop right there because didn't we just read in 13, Who is he that will harm you? This is the proof that that's not talking about you're going to not suffer. If is, is kind of subjective, but this verse is an argument against those that say, Hey, listen, as a child of God, everything's going to be rosy. Listen, if you think as a child of God, everything's going to be rosy, um, Somewhere down the line, there's something wrong with the path because I've never noticed that to be true. Um, I find, and, and please uh, feel free to correct me, I find that while I don't suffer, I do struggle daily to walk with Christ. Do you not? Now, I'm not saying it's, it's you know, a major, major battle every day, but you know, some days there's a lot of things that pull me away. There's a lot of things that say, hey, I need your attention over here first. I need your attention more. You know, you don't have time for the devotions today. You don't have time for all that prayer. You don't have time to read. Really? That's exactly all I got time for to start off with. Read the Word of God. Spend time in prayer. Spend my, um, you know, that's why I read all these books before y'all get to see them. I'm on one now by Oliver uh, B. Green, I think it is. Is it B? Oliver Green. And it's, um, it was written while he is, I think, three sermons that he preached on the Gospel Hour. Uh, do you remember that? The Gospel Hour? Um, I'm on one right now. Worry and anxiety versus faith, I think it is. Worry, either anxiety versus faith. It's got those two. 
really, really good. Uh, so it's been a blessing. So this is this is where I get my re-energizing. This is where I get my time um, and, and really you know, get an opportunity to spend time with God. And he's got all these verses in his sermons and I get to look those up. And so, yeah, praise the Lord that, that I can't miss that time. And I hope you don't miss it either. I hope it's valuable enough. Do you think no way I'm going to let anything get in between me and God on this? You need that time. I mean, he says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, um, Who suffers? Who is he talking about? The believers suffer. Lost aren't worried about being righteous, are they? They don't care. If the believers suffer for righteousness, well, I thought that if I was serving God, everything would be, be fine. I, I mean, I trusted in Him. Why do I have to go through this? You remember the tomato plants? You don't want, huh? You ought to get your roots down. Unless you're struggling. I remember there was a Muslim boy come up to me and he, um, he said um, he said he had a problem. I, I, I don't know why I got him, but anyway, they, they brought him to me. I was fairly new on the field at that point. And he said, I got a problem. I said, what is it? He said, I can't tell you. Well, how can the world I help you if you can't tell me what the problem is? So I, I tried to, to nudge him. I sat and talked with him for a while and, and just kept trying to, he wouldn't tell me. I thought about that thing and thought about it. And finally I said, uh, and I just believe this of the Lord. I said, are you struggling with it? He says, yeah. I said, okay, call me when you stop. As long as you're struggling, it's good. When you stop struggling, I want to know which way you went. Did you give it over to God and are you walking in the Spirit or did you give over to the flesh and walking in the flesh? But if you're struggling with it, it tells me the battle's still going. I want the battle to go. I don't want it to stop. And I hope that, that when you're in that battle that you're going into the Word of God for your answers, that you're seeking what God wants to, to tell you, what he, how He wants to lead you. So often, I think the case is, we're like, man, I give up. You ever heard that? I've seen a lot of people give up. You don't want to give up. God doesn't give up on you. You shouldn't give up on God. It is through these struggles we get the power. And we... And, and, we get the strength to have the victory in whatever it is. Um, there was a young man, Bruce and I knew, uh, we'd get around him, we'd be talking, and, and he would ask questions, we'd give him the answers from the Bible. He says, I wish I had that spiritual knowledge. You know how you get it? You walk with God 20 years, 30 years, and that's how you get it. When you just get saved, it's like uh, people... Um, I remember when I was younger, uh, there would be some men and, and, and some couples that were retired. They were in their elder years, and you know they're 65, 70 years old. They've retired now. They've gotten all these, accumulated all these things uh, through life. And these young bucks come up, these young people, anywhere from 15 to 20, and they say, you know, why can't we have all that? Because you hadn't spent 30, 40 years of your life accumulating it. It's the same thing walking spiritually. Wisdom doesn't come to youth. It comes through time and the application of the knowledge you get and spending time with God. I mean, it just doesn't happen overnight. But you'll wake up one day and you'll look down and you're no longer 16, you're 61. You're like, wow, I know where that's at in the Bible. Wow. I understood why God is doing that now. You know, you, He gives you that wisdom. But it's a daily walk. It's a battle. It's a struggle. It's a conscious decision to walk with God. And no matter what happens, you continue that walk. We'll stop there. Does anybody have anything you want to add? Questions? Um, for some reason, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm missing something. I'm not getting enough questions or or something, I don't know, but anyway. All right, let me, um, let me give you, uh, that's all. I got a letter.